Welcome to HortTube. My name is Jim Putnam. This is a Sunday garden question and answer video that I haven't done uh, in a while. I was doing these uh, every Sunday for a while and I kind of took a break uh, from them, but I'm gonna get back to them. If you wanna ask gardening questions down below this video, I will answer them and pick through them and answer them in next week's uh, question and answer video. There's a playlist on my channel called Garden Question and Answer Videos. If you wanted to really bore yourself, um, you could go back and look at um, lots of them uh, where I've answered lots of gardening questions over the years. So if I don't pick your question, sometimes it's because I've answered it several times uh, in those previous uh, videos. And uh, so folks that have been watching for a long time, I try to pick different ones uh, when, when I can, or you know, at least slightly slight variations of the, of the, of the same ones. Uh, so thank you guys for uh, following along with everything. I just mulched the uh, landscape. Several of the questions I'm answering in this are about, about mulching. Uh, the, um, uh, about a week away uh, from doing some propagation videos, if you've uh, followed me in the past for propagation, um, there's a playlist on my channel called Propagation. Uh, if you want to go back and learn how to make new plants and I'll be adding to that playlist uh, here during the uh, rest of the summer. So uh, thank you guys for following along with all of that. Um, let's get to some questions that I, I just picked out some questions that I had gotten over the last week or two uh, on the channel. Again, several of them related to my uh, uh, mulching efforts that I did here uh, last week. Uh, I always get the question about whether I use weed control fabric and no, I don't use weed control fabric. Um, I've got a uh, video on the channel called the pros and cons of weed control fabric has hundreds of thousands of views uh, and uh, where I gently tell people um, that, you know, it's a very temporary, it's a very temporary fix. If you put down weed control fabric, there probably is some period of time for sure where you're going to obviously have less weeds. Uh, and then unfortunately the squirrels and the birds and everything else uh, decide to put weed seeds on top of it. And then so, and also the, 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 the fabric itself actually breaks down over time. I made a mistake in that video because I, I grabbed a roll of weed control fabric that was a very lightweight fabric. It was just something I could hold in my hand while I did that video. Although I have lots of experience with very heavy duty weed control fabric because that's what we used at the nursery to grow plants on. And, but in that video, I've got a light roll of fabric in my hand and everybody's like, oh, you're using the wrong fabric. That's what's actually going on. No, no, the, the heavy duty fabric breaks down as well. I had it at the nursery for, 20 years and uh it had holes in it everywhere um after after a period of time it, it plastic breaks down it gets brittle and it breaks down uh some of it obviously thicker more heavy duty um, plastic would last longer i've got a hummingbird on a salvia right in front of me oh man i wish i had the camera the other way uh i don't though so I don't use weed control fabric. You do you. This isn't a whack people over the head kind of channel. You, you do whatever you, know, you want to do, but it is a temporary fix. It prevents my mulch from breaking down and actually improving the soil below it too. Because part of how I feed plants here is the mulch breaks down and becomes nutrients um, for my plants to actually take up. So it's a, it's a way I'm fertilizing as well. Put a plastic barrier down in between the soil and that mulch and that you know, that impact goes away. So no, I don't use weed control fabric. Um, next question I had on was why I was mulching in July. I actually, and I've talked about this several times, I'd actually prefer to mulch in the late winter, early spring, and then again in early fall with just about two inches. I don't go, I don't put four or five inches of mulch down. I put a thin layer a couple times a year. I didn't mulch back in March because I knew how many projects I had going on in this landscape. Um, I'm in Raleigh, North Carolina, zone 7B. If you haven't been following along with the channel, um, welcome. And uh, this, is a, this project's been, you know, I've added a lot this spring and I didn't want to mulch before and then tear it all up uh, during the season. So I just waited until I finished a lot of the projects. And uh, so here we are. Uh, <laughs> and I'm mulching in July and it was hot outside and all those kinds of things. Uh, I watered it though as I put it down because the mulch in the pile actually is composting in the summer when it's hot and uh, so I'm, the mulch was very hot so as I was putting it down occasionally I put a sprinkler out and uh, did, did a little bit of irrigating on it. Somebody asked if I watered heavily beforehand. No, I, I actually get pretty regular rainfall here so I didn't have any reason to, uh, to water it um, before I mulched. Um, and, I always, I always water after I mulch. I want to settle the mulch in. Just in the process of cleaning everything up, I'll water, 
you know, I water everything and I'm also trying to cool that mulch off some just in case it was composting and it's super hot. Uh, let me see, was there anything else on the mulch? Uh, somebody asked about slime mold. Uh, if you've, um, a lot of you have probably seen this. It looks like a dog threw up on your mulch. Those are slime molds. Slime molds tend to happen in areas where the, where wetter areas in your yard or during extremely wet periods of time, or maybe you over mulch. Maybe you're a person who puts down four or five inches of mulch at one time. I tend to see more slime molds in those cases. They're not hurting your plants in any way, shape or form. I realize it looks disgusting and it's not, um, it doesn't look the best. I had more slime molds at the old house. I haven't had any in this landscape uh, so far. I've been super careful here of just putting down thin layers of mulch each time. And uh, so I'm not keeping this. There's no spot in this landscape that's been kept overly wet. And so I haven't had the issue here, but that's what's going on. Those slime molds are interesting because they're not, they're not a fungus. They're not a plant. They're not a bacteria. They're not an animal, obviously. They're not, you know, they're their own thing. Uh, so I think there's like, I don't know, a hundred species of slime molds, maybe more. I, I don't know how many there are, but, but they actually are, feeding on bacteria that forms in wet spaces. So they actually could be beneficial uh, in the spaces that they're happening in, okay? And uh, not, not, they're not hurting anything and likely are beneficial. If you're seeing a spot where you're getting slime mold over and over and over again, you may wanna try to correct those conditions, maybe raise that, pull that mulch back, raise that space a little bit, or use less mulch in that space in the future and see if you can dry it out. Maybe you're over irrigating all of those kinds of things. You can dig them out with shovels if you want to, or rakes or whatever. You're probably spreading it about by doing it. Um, but you really, you need to change the conditions in order to actually get rid of the slime molds. Okay, um, let me see. On my July checklist video, uh, somebody asked about whether they should be pruning their uh, butterfly bushes uh, in the summer. I deadhead mine meaning I take off the spent flowers as, 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 they, as they go. It just looks, the plant looks a lot better. It's tedious, but it looks a lot better to take off the, the, the spent flowers. The only time I really would have to really prune a butterfly bush hard is if you have one that tries to grow eight feet on you every season. I've got one here that's in a little bit too much shade and uh, it stretches quite a bit and it blooms beautifully, but it stretches so much that it actually is now vulnerable to having some sort of storm actually break the whole plant open. So I'll let that thing bloom heavily and then I'll actually just cut it in half at some point, maybe the first of August, and it'll just flush back out and, uh, and bloom again. But I do that to butterfly bushes that I think are vulnerable to splitting open because I've seen that many times where one gets eight or 10 feet tall and then a storm just breaks it open um, and uh, can actually kill them. Uh, amazingly enough, but uh, by, by just splitting them open down at the uh, bottom. So uh, as long as it's compact and full, no real reason to have to do any pruning on it other than deadheading it. Once, uh, if it's stretched big time on you though, you might want to consider at some point cutting them. Uh, another thing on the July checklist video um, was conversations about babying plants. I've talked many times about not babying uh, plants. Uh, funny thing about this babying plants thing I, there are videos on this channel where I, you know, plant something, you know, have a conversation about the plant, then plant it. And then at the end of the video, I'll go, I'm just going to water this in and, um, you know, and then I'll check it on a daily, you know, a daily basis for a little while to see if it needs water. And then I'll water it. And then the video ended and I put the camera away and went and edited the video and I never watered the plant. Um, <laughs> I'm in the southeast, we get regular rainfall, a lot of times the soil's moist. It is best to water them in when you first plant them, but you would be amazed how many of the plants you guys have seen me plant that maybe got watered once. Um, I, I'm really, um, I'm tougher on plants than, uh, than, than most people. A lot of that comes from experience. Uh, I, you know, I, I know, I'm not at all paranoid about it. Most of these plants will let me know uh, that, 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 that they're dry but I typically will water something and then, man, I'll go a little while and then I'll go over and check it. Um, I, I've got, what I talked about in the July checklist video was um, a canary in a coal mine. And for me this year, it's a Shasta daisy over here that wilts uh, every afternoon. When that thing is wilting, that's when I kind of go around and look for other things that may need some water that I know need water. But these established shrubs that are in this landscape, 
um, they can tell you that there ain't no babying going on out here. I am uh, pretty tough on them. I do have this layer of mulch down. I did compost this soil. I've done all the things that would lead them to success, but they're not getting water from me, uh, you know, unless it gets really dry, these established things. So I'm tough. I'm, I'm tougher on things than you guys would think. You would think by looking at this landscape that I'm babying it along. The only things that are getting watered every day are perennial flowering things, annual flowering things, and containers, and not all of them either. They're all getting checked as well before they get water. The shrubs are would, the shrubs that have been in the ground more than 12 months at this point, they're not getting any water. Um, I'm gonna wean them off unless I go into some sort of drought conditions. Okay, um, uh, somebody asked me about uh, sky pencil hollies, and so I thought I would, about being drought tolerant. This is one plant that won't let you know that it's dry. So if you have sky pencil hollies, the little thin Japanese hollies, uh, that is a plant that will not let you know that it's dry before it just dies. That thing needs ongoing watering for sure. Uh, and this is true with all Japanese hollies, like soft, um, soft touch hollies. I got a neighbor up the road that's probably pulled out 15 soft touch hollies this past year. We had a wet enough year that an established shrub shouldn't be dying, but those things, are very wimpy um, and I think kind of most Japanese hollies are but especially sky pencils and they won't let you know so if you have sky pencil hollies know that you need to be watering them uh, you know on a regular basis there are very few plants that I would say that about but those are particularly uh, wimpy and it was the only plant at my nursery a shrub that we left pot to pot and so I, I left all those pots pot to pot so when the water came on they were getting double, maybe even triple the water that plants that were spaced apart um, in the nursery were getting. Um, so, you know, they're, they're kind of water hogs. Uh, so, yes, if you've noticed them dying, there's a reason for it. Um, okay, a uh, lot of tough growing um, conditions uh, this, this past year. And so, so many people have been welcomed uh, to gardening, you know, by because of COVID. And then... Uh, we have, you know, the worst freeze ever in Texas and we have 116 degree temperatures and we have seven, you know, hurricanes hit the Gulf last year and we have, or whatever it was, uh, we had, you know, massive rainfalls, um, all over the place where you're getting, you know, 10 inches of rain, um, you know, in, in, in a month where you should have gotten three or, you know, or no rain at all. I mean, my, my year has gone wet, wet, wet all winter into mid-March to the end of April, got zero rain. <laughs> My highest water bill since I moved into this house was in April. Why would it be April? And then since then though, it turned the faucet back on and it's been, you know, uh, very wet and I've had to do almost no watering. So um, it's been an, uh, it's not always like this. <laughs> That's what I'll say. But I know for many of you between ice storms and wind storms and uh, droughts or floods or s ridiculously high temperatures. Uh, it seems like uh, uh, this is the way it is, but it's typical, you know, it, it's, it's not really, uh, it, it's not this hard to garden. Uh, so again, um, just so many of those comments this past year about, you know, people lost their entire landscapes in Texas and, you know, um, and, and there's no plants. I mean, a lot of the plant shortages we've seen were from COVID initially where, where folks were, uh, uh, you know, buying plants for that reason. And now we've got replacement plants for, you know, half the state of Texas, which is, um, you know, it's a big place with a lot of people and a lot of landscapes to, to replace plants in, uh, which has you know, extended the shortage of plants. Um, somebody had a great comment in the uh, July um, checklist video that I thought I would pass on. It was about containers. I talked about uh, watering your containers and uh, thoroughly before you leave town or, you know, or you know potting them up into larger containers and they said that they always watered theirs thoroughly and then moved them over to the shade which is something i've also done in the past but then when i'm shooting those videos at that particular moment i don't remember to say those things so thanks for pointing that out that is one option to take your hanging baskets and all of your containers water them thoroughly sometimes two or three times it can take to get them thoroughly wet move them to a super shady space and then when you get back home um, rehang them uh, and put them back where they were. So I thought that was a uh, that was a good call. Uh, last question I get: um, somebody asked about the red flowers that are in the background of a lot of my videos, and that uh, saucy red salvia back there is a great 
great performer uh, in the landscape. This is the second year I've had it in that spot. And that's what the uh, hummingbird was on earlier when I said there's a hummingbird behind the camera. Thank you guys for watching these videos and following along and uh, happy Independence Day to everyone. Um, and uh, ask questions down below and I will pull from those for next week's question and answer video. Thanks again.